Hello everybody, Coach Mike here, Coach Mike now, and this is a very special episode for multiple reasons. This is my 100th episode of Coach Mike now. So it's going to be even better, it's going to be the best ones we've ever had. I think you're going to enjoy it. But before we get into it, of course you can find me at CoachMikeNow.com or and this is a new one for me too, ncbusinesscoach.com. You can catch me out there. My email address, coachmike at coachmikenow.com. I want to tell you also, where you, oh, you got to follow me on Rumble, Facebook, and YouTube, especially on Rumble. That's where I put most of my content. I'd really appreciate it. If you follow me, you like this episode, make some comments, share the episode. Get the word out there that information that they can get at Coach Mike now is going to really open their eyes on some things now and then. Before we get into the show, I want to tell you about our sponsors. Sig Holcomb State Farm Insurance in Conover. You can get them at sigholcomb.com. That's S-I-G-H-O-L-C-O-M-B.com. Their phone number 828-464-5454. Sig is my insurance agent, and they do a great job, great customer service. Also, CustomLineupCards.com for all you baseball and softball coaches out there. And Coach Mike, now Business Growth Solutions. If you have a small business, I can help you with that. And last but not least, as a matter of fact, the one we want to thank for this excellent production today is Observable Media. They are filming this for us because I wanted the best production for the 100th episode and for the special guests I have here today. So thanks for tuning in. Today I'm going to have three candidates for the Catawba County School Board. Schools are a big issue. They're about our kids. We all say, oh, it's about the kids, it's about the kids. But sometimes it makes you wonder out there. So let me introduce you to the three people. Actually, I'm going to let them tell you about themselves a little bit and then we'll get into the meat of the program. Let's start with April Underwood. April, tell us about yourself. Well, I am married and we are a blended family. We have seven kids together and I'm a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for more than 20 years. I currently have my own business. I'm a holistic board certified nurse and I help people get healthy. And a few years ago, um, we started getting involved in politics and we saw the need for more people to get involved because of what was going on in our world. And we were not the kind of people to just stand by and just let everybody else do the work. We wanted to get involved. And so uh, we got involved with uh, Mark Robinson, that campaign. We also got involved with another group here in, here in Catawba County who was working specifically with the school system and um, specifically on the books that had piqued my interest because I didn't understand exactly what was going on. And so I got involved and um, the more that I knew, the more I realized that if not me, then who? Because we all have to take a stand. We all, all have a part to play in making our schools better and our kids, they all deserve to be stood up for. And so I decided at that point when I started to see what was going on in our county that we were going away from the conservative values that Catawba County holds, I wanted to be a part of being able to get us back there. Very good. David Goforth. Yeah, I'm David Goforth. I'm born and raised here in Catawba County. My family has been here many years. I'm a single parent. I raised my two children by myself and put them through college. Getting involved to want to run for the school board, um, I joined the Mark Robinson campaign, one of the first few the day that he announced he wanted to run for governor. Listening to his passion about these books, being a president of the Tea Party here in Catawba County, hearing other groups discuss this matter and what was going on in the school boards, I started attending the meetings and seeing what was happening for myself. I have two grandchildren, a six-year-old and a two-year-old. And being in these meetings and seeing what's happening, it laid on my heart, God put it there that I wanted to do something about it. And Mark being passionate in his campaign, I decided that the best thing I could do was at least try 
that if my children and grandchildren ask me one day, Dad or Grandpa, what did you do? At least I can tell them that I tried to do something to try to make a difference on the school board. Very good. And Clayton? Uh, yes, I'm uh, Clayton Mullis. Uh, originally, I was born and grew up in Lincoln County. Uh, I've been in Catawba County, uh, married, uh, have been in Catawba since 2020, uh, married two children, one at Fred T. Ford as a senior, and the youngest is a sophomore at Challenger Early College High School. Um, education is something that I'm passionate about and very privileged of our two daughters and proud of them. Uh, my background, I've been in the hardware business for nearly 20 years and also had a career in law enforcement. Uh, and I'm also prior uh, elected official uh, for Lincoln County's Board of Education from 2010 to 2014. Uh, and I think that experience there will uh, help me uh, with the situations that uh, be presented to us here in Catawba County. Uh, so I'm excited about it, excited about David and April running with those, these two individuals. Uh, we're all three are very compassionate, hard workers, and uh, I think we can deliver for the constituents of this county. Okay, we got a couple of issues. I'm a new guy here. I've been here six years. I followed my daughter back here. She met a young man here that was divorced, and they were both working at Knott's Berry Farm in California. And one Christmas she showed up and said, we're moving. And he was back here, and he had two daughters from his previous marriage. And we thought California girls should be back in a year. She wouldn't go back if you paid her. And so my wife was working for a company that had an ESOP. They cashed it out because the new company had bought, they didn't want to deal with it. So we said, we're going to North Carolina. And I'm glad we're here. This is like a lot like what I grew up with in Phoenix. Not quite as hot, but very similar. So many issues. You guys have shared some of the issues you have with the uh, school boards here and, and the whole climate in general. So let's take a look at a couple. How about growth in our county? What's, what's, what do we see as the big issue there? I think with the growth in our county, and we've seen an influx of growth in the eastern part of our county in the Sheryls Ford area, and that's very crucial uh, implementation. You hear many parents, uh, and I think it's very crucial for the board to have a plan in place because it costs money for buildings, infrastructure, and th those needs have to be addressed. Uh, not currently being on the board, don't know the whole process, how far the board is now, but I think from day one when we get in there, the, whoever the board is, you've got to be in there, be prepared. But number one, you've got to show leadership. Number two, we've got to build relationships with our county leaders, our state leaders, all our stakeholders that control the money. We need to make good investments for our children, for our teachers and our constituents that we have good facilities that meet our needs. And I think that our current board, some of our leadership, the communication lacks there. So it's gonna be leadership and communication to put our constituents and our students and our teachers first so that we can make sure we address the growth in our, in our county and stay ahead of it instead of working from behind. And Clayton, you mentioned uh, in the process there, you said eastern part of the county. Catawba County has an interesting dynamic here in that there's actually three school districts in the county. What is that, Catawba County? Hickory City and Conover Newton. Okay, so how what does Catawba County school boards cover? All the county schools that are outside the city limits. Okay, the outside so they're outside of Hickory and outside of Conover Newton. Okay. Now does Bunker Hill come under your yes. that is a county school. Okay, guys. I know it's you're like you're in Conover and then you're not in Conover. You know, sometimes it's a little hard to keep straight. They've changed and moved the boundaries so much recently that you have to know where they lie to be able to fall in those categories. Wow. Now, what boundaries do they need to move if city limits move out, move over to one side or the other, and balance out, you know, they grow into the other county. Okay. Yeah, I mean, to the other city limits, and they move them, and it makes it hard to keep up with. Changes the, where the schools are. So you actually have some schools that we're in one district once, now they're in another district? They send them to another district because of that, yeah. Wow. Now how long, how many members are on the school board here? Seven. 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 Have they been all in there very long as far as uh, length of service? Well, we have one that has been in there for 12 years, but he is, um, he'll be finishing up in, in November. 
and then we have um, another that has been in there for two terms and so there and then we have the three that are in there for one one term um, Michelle and Don and and Tim and they were voted in in 2020 so the is it every election three more or no, it just depends on how many seats are up. This, I'm sorry, there's a bee here. Um, so this particular election, there's three seats that will be open. And those are one term, one year? One, they're four years. Four years, okay. Mm -hmm. And then next time there will be four. Now, is there a term limit then on school board members? Like the 112, is is he retiring cause, just to retire? Or? No. Um, voted out in the primary. He was voted out in the primary. Oh, okay, okay. So we got that, okay. Mm -hmm. Talking, you were mentioning talking about new um, school and, and resources spending. Overall, what do you think the biggest issue is of misspending if there is? Is there somewhere that they're really weak on that they could be a lot better? Um, not, not being on the board, I, I can't speak to that particularly. Uh, there have been other facilities that we have heard, uh, one for instance is Manny's High School's gyms leaking. Uh, I'm not there, I'm not going to point the finger, finger or blame at anyone, any particular person or group, uh, but I think that that's uh, disappointing that any of our facilities should be in that dire need or shape. Uh, and I think the needs assessment, when we have to have it, there has to be a determination between a need and a want. And there should be no facility that any child's in, any staff members in that we have a roof leaking. Uh, funding sources and all those type of things are, are different avenues where you have to spend funding and different things, capital, out, capital outlay money that comes from the county. Um, those things have to be determined, but uh, the board has got the lead, number one, because you're the top bosses for the school system. Uh, we've got to be leading and make sure that we're addressing those needs. Now you can't fix everything overnight, but uh, I think the communication is going to be so crucial to uh, to address these needs. Now, what is the hierarchy of authority as far as the school board to the schools and answering up to the state? So, the um, well, the school board. You know, there's there's seven of us, and then we have the superintendent, and then we have um, our have Catherine Truitt who is the um, superintendent of public instruction North for North Carolina. Well, North Carolina, okay. Now can the superintendent take actions without board approval or does board approve everything? Uh, Clayton. Uh, now it's been 10 years since I've been on board. There are some things that are determined that the superintendent does have authority over and usually those are deemed by the board. Um, but any decision, even personnel, uh, any decision that is made by the school system, every single decision, whether it be monetary personnel, school facilities, contracts, all those type of things, uh, superintendent contract, board attorney contract, all those things have to funnel back through the board for approval. So everything does uh, have so you got pretty much control on. Yes. Okay, very good. Um, you mentioned facility needs, improvements, repairs. In general, how old are the schools? Do we have any really old schools here that? Yes. David? We have the Bandy's High School. It's been around for quite a while. I don't know specifically the age. Uh, Newton Conover has had improvements to that high school, but I graduated there in 79, and there were some relatives that were there in the early 70s. So oh. it's, been a while, it's been around a while, but it has had some improvements. and are working on some now as we speak, but there are some that have been here a while, yes. So the older schools obviously are gonna need more. Well, Bandy's, I know during um, early voting, back in the primary, I had multiple parents stop and talk to me when I would you know, ask them if I could talk to them about the school board race, and they point blank would say, well, what are you gonna do about Bandy's roof? the kids have buckets of water. Wow. So it, it's not just a leak, it, according to these parents, you know, they actually have buckets out when it rains that it, it's that much. And I just, I just thought that was, I couldn't believe that. 
right. um, that we would have a facility that wouldn't, you know. You might have one once in a while here or there, but. Exactly, and you, know, you don't expect perfection, but you don't expect it, you know, one of your schools to have buckets sitting out. And I guess this has been going on for a while. And so we know that some of these repairs are on the top of the list for some parents in our county. And so we've talked about uh, looking at other means, you know, outside of the budget to be able to to be able to repair some of these things. And like he was talking about, you know, making you know making sure that we're we've got good relationships with those that control some of the purse strings, so that you know when at, when we get in there, we can and see exactly what the needs are, and we start hearing more from these parents and teachers then we can go to these folks that we've been building these relationships with over the last few months and say, hey, here's what they say that our county needs. So we have taken these last few months and been, to, we've been talking to people. We've been talking to parents. Uh, I've had meetings with teachers um, because we want to hear um, what they want done in our county you know we want to hear what's important to them and so we wanted to use these last few months that you know in between the primary and election to be able to to be able to figure out some of those things i'm sorry this <laughs> bee is it we're going to interview that bee we're going to interview that bee here yeah. before we get done maybe that's what we need to do so he'll leave <laughs> but um there are things that we wanted that we wanted to investigate, you okay. know, as over the last few months. And we've done that because we know that there are things that are on the top of the list for some parents in our county. Now on these lists, is there a lot of hearing, we don't have any money to do this to fix it? Well, from being at certain board meetings, there seems to be an, you know, an allotment in certain funds for certain things. Um, they approved to have the parking lot for the school buses paved, which has been gravel for a long time and I think the approval was in $30,000 range. And I sat there and really got frustrated thinking about the Bandy's High School gym with the leaks and what they're doing there. Why aren't they making that a priority? And it seems to me that what they were told or was told to me that the funding comes from a different purse to be able to do that. And I don't understand why we would not use the funding regardless of what purse it is that is a pressing need it needs to be taken care of as soon as possible and it's not being done if i'm thinking about things let's pretend this is my house or my business my store i got a leaky roof and i got a gravel parking lot gravel parking lot isn't going to do much damage to my vehicle is it i think i'd want to take care of that leaky roof first and I think on the facilities, I think our newest high school dates back either to President Eisenhower or President Kennedy. The newest one. The newest one. But I will say, commend that the, through the years they have done a good job with the funds available to keep our schools up to date. But the other thing you have to look at, and this is where the communication and leadership that, that I, I mentioned so much comes into play. And uh, I'll just use this for example, Lincoln County High School did an assessments need, they were able to get funding from the state through their legislator leaders uh, to revamp their asset, uh, athletic fields. Uh, so I think that's one crucial thing that, the, the, that I think the current board has got to do is show we are the leaders of this county, we are the, the big stakeholders of this county that we make the decisions and we've got to be able to work out, have meetings with our constituents, our different high schools, see what their needs are because those athletic facilities, all the things are an investment that we're making, and we want to make a good investment for a return on investment. Uh, so I just feel that's one of the things that this board is lacking. They're not doing a good job of assessing things and, and talking to the people that they're day in, day out. And I feel with David and April and myself that we're going to ask the hard questions and tough questions and uh, work hard to, to achieve some things. Get good answers for these questions. So when you're in a board meeting, do you, is there a lot of stonewalling where they don't want to give answers or? It depends on what their agenda is for that meeting and how they approach that agenda, how quickly they go through it, were the actual board members given time to assess what was going on and what needed to be done. Okay. And as you know, a, a board, attending the, the meeting and sitting there 
listening to what's taking place and watching what's happening, it, it's a very quick moving thing. How many people generally, as an average, show up at a meeting, would you say? Average 15 to 25, depending. 15 to 25. And depending on what issue is going to be talked about at that meeting, it could be a full house yeah. where... I've seen some pictures. <laughs> a couple of, we'll get into that later, a couple of them get uh, overflowing crowds, shall we say. <laughs> uh, teacher retention, looking at new ways to address tutoring and raising test scores. So I have um, been blessed to be connected with some folks in another county who have kind of been mentoring me and, and have, are coming alongside me and are sharing lots of ideas with what they've done in their county that has been successful. And I've been able to bring the information to these guys and share it with them. And um, I am excited because the program that they have been using um, has been very successful in raising their um, scores. And it's a special ty type of tutoring that they have been able to do. And I won't get into all of the specifics, but you know, like I said earlier, we have spent these last few months trying to research and find things that would help our county. Because w when we I I get in there, if we're all, all elected, we want to be ready to go. We, are, we want to start making some good changes as soon as we get in there. We don't wanna have to wait and you know, look at all these different things. We wanna have some, some things under, you know, under our footing so we know, you know what direction we would like to go in. And, um, I'm really excited about um, the information that I've been given on this tutoring program. It's actually um, a program that was um, uh, UNC actually did a study on it and proved that it is a, a program that works. And so, um, and and there's some other specifics that they they changed and added in into their program that I think would be great to implement as well. But our scores are at, I mean, that is really, that is one of the top of the, top of the, the things at the top of our list. Because if our kids are not prepared when they leave our school system, they're gonna to get to college and then it's not gonna be a good experience. They're not gonna succeed and that is what they need. And even if they're not going to college, we want them to be prepared to go to the workforce. How many jobs right now do we need um, electricians and they have to do math or you know Tourists, all the uh, yes all kinds of, of oh, yeah, trades are important. Yes, yes, yes and and that's another thing someone had sent me a message about asking you know are you you know just for the kids that are going to go off to college or are you uh, for the kids that want to work and I said listen I was one of those workers I didn't go to college right off I didn't go to college actually for 10 years after I graduated. So I was one of those that went to work. And so I would love for Catawba County to have even more focus on um, bringing in some more vocational classes for our kids that don't want to go to college that would rather go to work. Now in the overall hierarchy again there, I guess that's my favorite word of the day. How is Catawba County Schools ranking with other schools as far as test scores? Are we where we just need some improvement? Or are we way low that we... We're a lot lower than we should be. Okay. And um, we're in the mid to low 40s. And a good average is in the 60s for EOGs. And a lot of children are behind reading level. Um, I've had friends that work in the bank that have had college graduates come in for loans. One could not sign their name in cursive to get a home loan. Another one couldn't do it to get a car loan. They had to have their parents sign. We have to make sure these kids can read, write, and understand the core education values and that they're prepared for that when they enter into the community. That they, they have that educational skill and make sure that they test at a good level. They have the program No Child Left Behind, but it seems like they're being pushed on whether they can read or write at the level that they should be reading and writing at and that, that's not appropriate. But I, I do want to give credit where credit is due. So Catawba County Schools, a lot of the schools did come up in their scores this year. So, you know, that is a great thing. Um, we had a couple that did go down it, um, just by a small amount, but 
um, overall the schools did come up so so that is a great thing so we would just like to come alongside the teachers and the kids and the parents and be able to maybe find some more things that can help them continue in that um, in that upward you know as they're as they're heading up um, I feel like this was a good year and I know I spoke with several teachers who were excited you know there's that their scores had had went up this year but then there's also teachers who say but it's not just about the scores and we get that too we do the one of the schools that I coached at in California before I moved here I had a teacher tell me one time that they were literally forced to pass kids on to graduation even though they were not ready and I, part of that, and I don't know how North Carolina works, but California, obviously, I think everywhere is money comes down from the state based on your graduation rate. Oh, let's graduate. What good are you doing them if they're really not ready? Now, we talked a little bit before we started airing here about illegal immigration and how that's affecting schools, but things don't happen overnight. So some of the things you're talking about, scores dropping, that's obviously been trending for a little while is... is what do you think is contributing to that issue? I think it's it, one one aspect would be that the, the actual classrooms are too large for the teachers. Okay. When you get, I think, personally above like 25 pupils in a class, that's manageable for a teacher. And as you grow up towards 30 and 32, you're you're looking at a really full class, and it's a lot for one teacher to be able to handle and manage. And I think, you know, the growth as far as what's happening with our schools, being able to expand them and get more classrooms or adding on to the facilities and making them better will help. But we also have to get teachers here that are capable of handling this and being able to teach the children, you know, uh, quality teachers that can educate, educate them the way they need to be educated. And that too comes from funding to be able to pay the teachers what they need to be paid and to attract better teachers with the pay that comes into the system. Clayton had mentioned teacher retention as an issue that we look at. Are we losing teachers because they're going to a school district where they get paid more or are they just retiring or are they maybe getting frustrated with too many rules that are tying their hands with stuff or what? Uh, a lot of it has come, not just our county, all surrounding counties, retirement. Uh, our local supplement, as far as pay, we are right up there neck and neck with competitiveness with our surrounding counties. Uh, and a lot of it is your monetary values, but I think what a lot of our teachers and staff want to see from, from a school board, from what they would call the top leadership, is that that we're one of them, that we come from them, that we're, we're hard workers and we're going to roll our sleeves up, and that we value education, we value our teachers. And I really truly do believe that if we want to train our replacements that we have to elevate the profession of teaching that is the most vital important profession that there is to have these kids prepared that if they're going to work hard that we want them to work hard and pass it on better than they found it. And uh, that's the type of commitment we've got to make. Okay, restructuring how school board meetings are conducted. What, what is the issue with that? Uh, from two years ago, the uh, prior to two years ago, before meetings, before December of 2022, the school board meetings started at, I believe it was 5 or 5.30. Uh, for most people, uh, most parents or people can't make it to those meetings because they're, they're working yeah, people working. to provide for their families. Uh, so the board moved them to 6 o'clock. Uh, one of the things I have been a proponent of and proposing is uh, the boards need to be more, the meetings need to be more efficiently ran. Uh, one thing I, I think that the board could explore is to have two meetings a month. And one of your meetings could handle your, your personnel, uh, your money dollars, things that come in and out, and personnel change frequently from the state, especially around June to July, because our budget runs July 1 to June 30th. So you have to have special meetings there per statute on those type of things. Uh, but to keep our personnel, finances, school field trips, all those type of things, have those meetings. But I think that second meeting could, could be towards all these issues that we've talked about, whether it be our athletic facility needs, our school needs, 
are talking about our growth is that we really get in there and we don't just talk about it and mention it to look good on the camera, but we really talk about, okay, how are we going to address this? And I think another part of that thing is, in Lincoln County that was very effective if we had big issues, is that we had committees set up like finance, curriculum instruction, um, policy meetings, and a particular board member would share that with a couple other members. So I think establishing committees where we could work on a particular issue, study it, and then bring that back to the full board uh, could be very efficient. So uh, uh, the public comments, I would like to see meetings where public in a respectful way can engage with the board and ask questions. I don't know all the legalities there of how we could do that, but I think people want to feel valued and appreciated when they come to their board meetings, and I think sometimes they don't feel that way. We're going to take a little break now. Uh, Coach Mike Now, coachmikenow.com. Just to again mention our sponsor, Sig Holcomb State Farm Insurance. Check him out at sigholcomb.com, customlineupcards.com, coachmikenow.com. And of course, observablemedia.com, who are the fine folks that are making this nice production for us. So let's get on to one of the big issues we know has been most passionate with all of you. And it's been getting a little crazy. And they're talking about books. <laughs> and it gets a little overheated at the meeting sometimes. I'm I did a little research here. I'm looking at this meeting from 2023, and there's there's crowds lined up out the, outside the building and everything else. And, and what's really funny, they always call conservatives that we're, our rhetoric, rhetoric is hateful and this and that, but it seemed to me they were calling a lot of names to you. That one guy uh, apparently called one of, one of you all uh, perverts or something because they said they had read this book. And uh, how bad has it really gotten? Well... First, I'll, I'm just going to start by saying, you know, the other side, their favorite thing to say, I believe, is that we're book banners. And we are not book banners at all. We just want to make sure that the, the material that is in our schools is appropriate. If a parent wants to get that material and, and introduce their child to whatever that is, they are free to do that. I just do not feel like it is the role of the school system to provide material that has strong content, adult content that is not age appropriate. And so we want, what we would want is to just have books that are, are educational and we can't figure out how the other side seems to think that the books that they're trying to keep in our school system, why they think those are educational. We don't see it that way. We see that it's a adult content that has definitely inappropriate material. Um, a lot of it is pornographic. A lot of it is um, abusive, actually. And I don't see a reason that our schools need to be a part in introducing our children to that type of material. You know, it's funny that Hollywood, the big TV studio, the you know, whether it's a TV show or a movie, they have to put a label on their movies right. that indicates some sort of age appropriateness. Right. Now, we all might agree or disagree with different ratings, right? We're all going to have a little different perspective. You might let your daughter start dating at 14 and April might want her daughter to be 19 or, you know. 30. 30. <laughs> I was going to be nice to say 21. Or, but, yeah, we all have different opinions of that. But it's funny that they will, they want to fight over allowing this material. But it cracks me up. And I'm looking again at this me, and this is from, uh, the story was from the public radio, WNC North Carolina, I guess is public radio back from September of 2023. And it, they, start, they started reading, oh no, there was a lady there that had the sign of the words that were in the book mm -hmm. and the TV station would not film the sign yeah, exactly. because it was in promotion, inappropriate. Well, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the material is pornographic and Statue of North Carolina states if that material was produced, introduced to a child or given to a child under the age of 17, 
it's a, it's a civil penalty for that. And that, that people that introduce that material to them can have a civil lawsuit taken against them. And that's a North Carolina statute. And to have them complain about a certain um, candidate running for office saying that he was looking at pornographic material, but then they fight to keep the same material in the school system, something's wrong here. Something doesn't make sense. So, you know, it, you, you can look at it as good and evil. Which side are you going to be on? Are you going to be in that trajectory that you think it's okay to show this to all the children, or is it not? You know, it's got to be one way or the other. You can't be in the middle. Right. The, uh, the one story there, yes, one of the people, they, I guess somebody had challenged them and said, did you read the book? You didn't even, and they said, so they, yeah, I went ahead and read the book. It's not something I normally read. And then somebody called that person a pervert. Well, you're arguing that I don't know what's in the book, so I'm going to read it. Now you're going to call me names there. Now, I know what we talked about earlier really about Florida. I believe in Virginia they had the same thing. I thought I heard one here in North Carolina too, where at the school board meetings, a parent would get up and start reading from one of these books, and the school board would shut them off and tell them, you can't read that, it's too vulgar. If it's too vulgar for your score, for your school board meeting, how to, for adults, how the heck are you putting it in there for our kids? That makes no sense. And that's our argument, and that's our fight. Why, why do people want to fight it so heavily? I wish we knew. I mean, we've asked. I have asked someone I've had a conversation with who was arguing with me about a particular book. And all the argument was that he could come up with was it, it was his right. It was the kid's right to read those books. And I said, where does it say that our school system has to provide that type of book? that type of material there there is none and we don't we don't want our kids you know to be exposed at school by that type of material I don't want my kids exposed to it at all but parents have that right to do whatever they can raise their children as they want to but when we're in school which should be a wholesome environment why do we need that type of material? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Basically That's education. exactly right. Yeah. We are here to teach them to read and that need, and to write and to learn how to do math. We don't we don't need that extra stuff. Our kids have enough extra stuff going on in their world at this point that we don't need to pollute them with other things. Sexual exploitation should be left out of the school system. Period. We don't believe it should be in there to be educated to the children. Do you think people in general, and I know there are parents that are against what you want, because I saw one of the article one of them had said, and even one senior in high school said, you know, I don't need mommy to babysit me. I can, get, I can make my own decisions here. But do you think that the parents that are arguing against your position, are they aware of how serious the overall um, world of pornography and everything is the sex trip. One of the things I was shocked at when I moved to North Carolina here is to find out that Charlotte, you know, you're thinking Hollywood, California. No, Charlotte, North Carolina is the capital of sex trafficking and, stuff, and human trafficking. Most children are introduced to this, and this came off of a Christian radio show at 12 years old. They have, ass have access to porn at 12 years old. And, you know, I know there's cell phones in most kids' hands, but they are lockable. And that's up to the parent to do that. And, you know, even though they access it, doesn't mean that we should put the material in the school library and have it there for them to access to. It's wrong. You want to know why rapes happen in schools, why things are going on that are inappropriate? But look at what you're putting in front of the children, whether you're teaching them basic laws of moral values and respect, are you teaching them how to sexual exploit another person? And it, it is funny because right away when you bring up your positions, what's the first thing? Oh, you're, you're a Christian. You're one of those people you want to block. You want a Bible bash and, and everything else. And that's not what we're, we're not saying your kid has to go to this church. Or your kid has to believe what we believe. We're just saying, I mean, the studies are out there. The studies are out there. 
I, mean, I remember years ago, I don't know if they're as still as mainstream as they were, but Focus on the Family had done a number of studies about the damage done to kids that are exposed to pornography at early ages. Because what do kids want to do? I mean, I got my five-year-old grandson challenges me on everything he can. Don't touch this. He's going to climb on it. Don't get that. Why can't I, Grant? You know, they want to know. And it's up to us as parents to say no. It's our job. It's our job. Them and educate them correctly. Where, where did, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, April. Well, I was just going to say, I feel like that when we're putting this kind of material in front of them, if we are constantly putting that in front of them, they're going to get desensitized to it. Yes. Yes. And so it's going to be easier to put just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more that is worse. And, and our society now has gone so far in one direction, you know, the middle of the road, you know, <laughs> the middle no more. it's not the middle anymore. And, you know, we're not saying, you know, oh my goodness, everyone, you know, has to be a, a Christian and has to believe like we do. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is we just want our kids to not have to be inundated with things that they shouldn't be at this age. We just want our libraries clean. Our school, I'm sorry, our children are on the front line today in the schools. They should only have to worry about coming to school, making their education, making their grade, learning what their teacher has given them, and being there with their friends. They shouldn't have to worry about social emotional learning or critical race theory or any of these things, pornographic material. They shouldn't have to be forced and faced with that. They should be able to go in there and learn their education, spend time with their friends, and go home. You know, it, it's really sad that we put them on the front line like that. And sadly, I mean, it, it, whether you want to realize it or not, some people choose to they block it out. Extreme, but it is a battle of good and evil. And the squeaky wheel gets the grease. How many positions, whether it's in a school board or even in general, in politics, do we see extreme measures passed? And they get passed because so many of us may be, oh, they'll never pass that. They'll never put that in there. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's right. And that brings me to something else. So I'm going to say, so why do you think we're there? Why do you think we have went so far to the other side? It's because we have been quiet for too long. Yep. We, it is time that those, the folks that say that they're conservatives and conservative Christians, we've got to start speaking up. I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of us, and, and I'm sure I was probably, you know, a part of this as well. Well, we're not going, we're not going to step on toes. We're just going to be quiet. We're just going to let them be. They're not bothering us. Well, <laughs> you know, it, we have got to a point where now we have to stand up. Because if we don't, then they're just going to keep on going in the other direction. And that's not what's best for our kids. Our kids don't need those extremes. And so I encourage everyone, you know, when I have messages every week about, you know, well, what's going on with the school board race? Is there anything I can help? Just talk about issues. Talk about these things. Talk about what's going on in our schools. Because a lot of people don't know exactly what is going on and we've got to start standing up we've got to start using our voice and saying exactly what we believe because you better believe the other side is doing it well look at the school now we've removed god we've removed everything that they, that they can possibly remove to that system and moral values and truth and now look at where we are what happens when you destroy all that Look at where we are. There was a study done years ago, and I, I want to say it was focused on the family, but it might have been another organization. But they showed all the negative statistics, crime, divorce, all these things, going forward from 1964 when prayer was removed from the schools. Now, we could joke around and say, okay, as long as there's going to be tests in school, there's going to be prayer in schools. But, you know, I grew up in Tempe, Arizona, and I remember that, yeah, we had the Ten Commandments on the wall, or the, and you had the Constitution and everything. And I had somebody recently on Facebook, they had the Ten Commandments. What's wrong, with, what's wrong with teaching kids, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not cover your neighbor's property? Right. 
But now you take, like you said, they take that out. And again, we go back 1956, Nikita Khrushchev, who? Nikita who? Said, we will take over America and we will not fire a shot. And there's, I've read articles about the National Board of Education, how the uh, atheists have infiltrated over the years. They don't come out one time and say, we're going to do all this. But how do they do it? They go after the children. And little go after the children, little by little. And you know, what's that great saying? The only thing needed for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And women. <laughs> and women. Uh, where, how did a school, we get to the B where a school board would get to this position? And, and I mean, it's not the only one here, it's across everywhere that they think they have a moral high ground over parents that they know better, whether it's books in the library, whether it's medical treatment, having kids get medical treatment without parent consent. I mean, that just blows my mind. That's where I go through and want and have pushed in my campaign to have truth and transparency because without that, the parent doesn't really know what's happening with their child at school. They don't know what they're being taught. They get a report card. Do they know how that grade got there? Are they getting, if there's a bad grade, is their child getting help for that? They don't know. And having truth and transparency back in the school system, I believe like at Challenger where my children attended, they had a PA or personal attendant. And that person called me every week on Friday and let me know how my children were doing, how their grades were, if they were um, being successful or if they were failing. If they were failing, what was being done to help them out? Every Friday, I got a report. I was called. If they didn't get my call, they called me on Monday. But I knew what my children were doing. They had truth and transparency. My children both are really good in the community. They have really successful jobs, and they are doing a really good job in their life. And I can hand that to that school. It was very successful for them. And I think that system needs to be inundated into our county schools and city schools. Now, how much of what's going on now also, how much do you think was contributed by parents that didn't take the time to care, to show up at parent-teacher conferences perhaps, or not find why did Johnny get this F, you know, whatever it is? How much is from apathy from the parents? I, I don't think, I think the majority of parents truly do care. I think that they're busy. They are, you know, most of the time it's um, both of them working and sometimes they're single parent households working multiple jobs or grandparents. So I don't want to put any of this really on the parents. Um, home life does affect the kids, it does. Right. But, you know, as far as what is happening in the schools with the laws and all of that, you know, we don't expect that our school systems are going to create things that are not going to be good for our kids. I think a lot of these things, um, as far as like slipping these books in, um, I think that those things have just been done and we just didn't know until somebody started realizing, hey, gosh, we've got things in our, in our libraries that we shouldn't have. But I, w I wouldn't ever want to put it um, off on the parents at all because they've got a big responsibility. Oh, sure. and, and the other thing, you know, we talked a little bit about SB 49, the um, Senate Bill 49 is the Parental Bill of Rights. You know, I, the three of us believe that nobody should have control over the kids except for the parents. And North Carolina, unfortunately, has some of the absolute weakest laws of um, you just would not believe. We are, I believe it's numbers, um, there's 17 states that have laws very similar to us. So, and we're at the bottom um, for, parent, for parental lot rights. And NC Values is actually an organization that is championing, um, trying to get the legislation changed so that parental laws are strengthened, so that school systems, hospitals, doctors cannot come in and say, okay, well, you know, your child wants this and um, you either consent or we're going to take the child. That is actually happening in other states. Wow. That is happening in other states. And um, 
it's very sad that a child can actually be taken, but. Um, well, tell us about that form. You talked about a form where the last line they wanted parents to sign at the meeting. So the f I had a parent um, from our county send me the health care form that was handed out this year at the beginning of the school year, and she refused to sign it because it was too vague. So that last line basically said it was just a very broad statement about being able to get care or refer the child out. I personally feel like that's too vague. I feel like um, that, pro that statement probably, uh, if there was anything that they needed um, referring out, that parent needed to be called before they referred them out. But the way that that was worded, it appears that um, that they would be able to refer that child out. And so without, because if they signed it, then they were opting in. They were, they were given permission, yeah. And so I, um, that is something that I hope, you know, as a nurse, you know, having a nursing background and um, knowing about some of these things, um, I hope that I'll be able to give some input and be able to protect parents in regards to that because there should be nothing in that um, no a child stuff, should be yes. referred out to. Exactly, no, no sneaky, sneaky stuff. stuff. They should be transparent. Hmm. Well, let's, and I, I don't want to turn this into an issue, but of course abortion is a big topic. And there are school, or schools where they, they want, school wants to be able to, if your daughter wants an abortion, that she can go and, and not tell the parents. And, you know, we all go, wait a minute, what? Are you out of your mind? But then you have somebody, and always they always find that one example, right? Well, uh, she said that she's being abused at home or it was rape or incest. How would you handle that situation? How, how can we make that exception? Well, first of all, in North Carolina, it, they can't. Um, okay. That is the one thing that um, they they, they can't help. It, mm -mm, they okay. cannot help a child do that. If if the child's 18 years old, obviously they can you know make their own yeah. their own sure. decision. Sure. But that is the one thing in the current law that they cannot do. Um, how would we? How how exactly would we handle? How would how would you how would you handle that? Say, say if you were a principal of school, or whatever, and you had a child. Well, I'm pregnant, and your first instinct is let's call mom and dad and see what's going on here. And she says, "Well, wait a minute, it was my stepdad or whatever." Well, I think that would be a case for social services. Yes. We would, I mean, there wouldn't be anything that really the principal could do other than get the Authority counselor involved. and the social services involved. So. We have, there's got to be an avenue. Right, there is. And, and that, that, I think that's the point of um, SB 49 is if, you, if, if the parents are not a safe option, then you have to go another option. It's not the school's um, decision to make for that child, to take that child somewhere to get the care. There has to be somebody else. And it's, we just don't feel like the school system should be Shouldn't be the should, parent. Should not be the parent, right. exactly. Right. It should be an, someone else, you know, at, at the county, you know, a social, a social worker, social services somewhere, somewhere, somebody else. I've been a school girls softball coach for many years, mostly in California, and always had the, emer all athletics has that emergency form, because obviously if there's something, a serious thing right now, you got, don't have time to be calling the parents, right? So there are, there are cases where you got to do something. But going to the extent that they're going these days with, you know, surgeries or abortions or everything else, I get upset just because you can argue abortion both sides all day long, but nobody ever says the big problem is it's being used as birth control now. Right. And we have many options for birth control. We can, yeah, we can make an exception for life of the mother, for rape or incest, but nobody, you don't hear anybody on either side hardly ever saying, Gee, we usually have over 50 million abortions because their people are using it as birth control. So, uh, but some school, apparently some states are allowing the schools to make the decision to help the child there. And, you know, but then when they want more money, who do they call? The, oh, the parents. If you get divorced, you got to pay child support. Right? I mean, there's so many examples, but yet we want to allow exceptions here. It doesn't make any sense. Last time around, last day, we're just about, I'm really glad you three came out here today. 
And what I'd like you to do is go each one of you real quick, make a final statement, and if you would, give the, give the audience a way to contact them. If, if a parent sees this video and has a question they want to talk to you in depth, maybe they've been reading the paper and, oh, these guys are bad. But ladies and gentlemen, there was a meeting not too long ago where a local newspaper reporter, after the meeting, a very contentious meeting, talked to one side of the issue, but walked by these people. Totally ignore Now, if you're a reporter, aren't you supposed to get sort of both sides of it? Doesn't happen. So, quick final statement, and how can people contact you? Clayton, start us off. Okay. Uh, you can reach me on Facebook. Uh, my page is uh, Clayton Mullis for Catawba County Board of Education. Uh, my info is there, or if you go uh, to the County Board of Elections, you can reach me by email or telephone. Uh, I'm open. Any concerns, questions you may have, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and I think Dave and April, all of us have been very open and communicating with people. So uh, uh, we just appreciate your prayers, number one, your support, and uh, we'll work hard to try to deliver good results for our county and uh, fight hard every day for our students, teachers, and, uh, and the people of this great county. April? So I have a Facebook page. It is April Underwood for Catawba County School Board. Um, and just like with Clayton, you can go to the county and get our um, emails and our phone numbers from there if you wanted to reach out that way um, or just message me on Facebook. I guess the, the biggest thing that I just want to say is that the three of us, um, when, we, when I decided to run, um, it was not something that I had ever considered doing, ever. Um, you know, I'm a nurse. Uh, that that's what I do and um, had never considered running for office or having anything to do you know with the school board but there is a need there is a need for for people to stand up and speak for these kids and make sure that they have an education that is going to help them to succeed in life and um, I really believe that you know, just working with these guys when we teamed up, you know, at the beginning of the year and, and decided we were going to run together, we, I know their hearts, I know mine, and it is for the kids. This is about the kids and making sure that they have the best future that they can have. And we will work hard. We, we have already started actually, because we've already started you know, researching and investigating all different kinds of avenues. And, and we are open, you, know, you can call me any, you know, or message me. I'll be glad to talk to whoever if they have questions. We actually welcome that because that helps us know, you know what everyone's thinking. We want, and we, we welcome that, we want to know. So, um, they can call, you know, message or email anytime. But um, if if there's one thing that any that the folks that are watching today um, knows about me, it is that I am here because I believe I know that our children, their future, can be so much better if we all really make sure that their education is all that it can be. I want to make sure that their reading and writing and their math, they know how to do that and they're well prepared so that when they leave us, they're gonna be successful. And that's what we'll work hard to do. David? You can reach me also on Facebook. I have a page there, David Goforth from Catawba County Schools and uh, our information at the education. Um, you can find me on the phone book, I'm, I'm listed. Um, I do believe being with April and Clayton meeting these two. Um, I signed up on the last day to be able to register to run for school board. I had to pray about it and God waited on my heart that I needed to be there to speak for these kids. I have two grandchildren that I want to have the same, at least the same opportunities that I had growing up. I want all your children to have a good opportunity to get a good education. And it's possible. You just have to have the people that are willing to fight and stand up for the kids. And I know with April and Clayton, that's gonna happen. The three of us have the same mindset. We wanna fight for the children. We want the best for these children that's possible. We know the parents, grandparents, and foster parents that are raising children, how hard it is because we've raised kids ourselves. 
and we know what's out there. So we believe in our hearts we will be a good opportunity for Catawba County to fight for these kids. Very good. I'm so glad to have had you all three here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've ever watched my show very long, you've heard me say before, politics is a two-part word. Poly, which is Latin for many, and ticks, which are blood-sucking creatures. It doesn't have to be that way. And we, we keep hearing whether it's on a federal level, state level, or even a local level. Why do people got to be so vicious in their attacks just so they can win and they control the episode? Shouldn't we all want the same thing? Shouldn't we want what is better? Or are there other motives? I don't know. I don't have all the answers. They don't have all the answers, but they're out there going to work and try. So thanks again for tuning in. CoachMikeNow.com. Leave your comments there on Rumble or email me or, or uh, hook me up on Facebook, on Messenger. I want to hear from you. What do you mean? Somebody want to come on and discuss the issues here? We'll be glad to do another show for you. Have a great day. God bless. Coach Mike, I'm out.